Mark chapter 6 and verse 1. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 says this, that Jesus went away from there and came to his hometown and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense. Everyone say offense. Say it with a bit of attitude, offense. They took offense at him, and Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled. For everyone watching at home, I just spilt my water. That's fine. (laughs) Worst things have happened. I've fallen off stage when preaching before, so that's mild. (laughs) Everything's fine. And Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. And so he then went on about uh, about or among the villagers teaching. I want to speak to you uh, this morning about red flags to a life of faith. Red flags to a life of faith. Have you heard of the term red flags? People say, oh, it's a red flag. It kind of was trending on social media a few months back. Where when someone says, oh, red flag, what they're saying is, problem here. Uh, They're saying, pay attention. They're saying, warning, not a good sign. And, uh, you know, red flags were kind of circulated on social media around like relationship red flags. If it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend or maybe just a friendship, uh, just just red flags that should be warning signs. Uh, People talked about um, people who are rude to waiters at cafes. Who knows, red flag. Don't marry that person. What about people who don't put the shopping trolley back in the trolley bay? Red flag. (laughs) Telling you, it's a red flag. People who can't apologize, red flag. People who litter. If you're feeling convicted this morning, feel convicted, but it's a red flag. What about this one? People who say, no, I don't drink coffee. (laughs) That's a red flag, right? Because I'm just saying, if they're not on the legal substances, they're on an alternative, all right? What about when you go to a steak restaurant and people say, oh, yeah, well done. Red flag. you got to end it right there. This is probably the biggest red flag, and this is going to help some of you, when people put pineapple on their pizza. Red flag. Major red flag, church. If, if they would desecrate a pizza like that, imagine what they would do to your hopes and dreams, all right? Red flag, church, red flag. So we all know the idea of red flags, and uh, we know the idea of red flags in relationships, but I wonder if you've ever thought about red flags in a relationship with Jesus. Like, what would be the red flags to a life of faith? What would be the things that we should go, okay, warning sign, don't go ahead, don't go that way. Well, some stories, some episodes in the Bible are included in there for our imitation and for our emulation, but there's other stories and episodes recorded in the Bible, not for our imitation, but rather for our warning. And what we've just read from Mark chapter 6 is one of those red flag stories. It's, It's basically a surefire guide in how not to relate with Jesus. It is Mark chapter 6. So so let me give a a little bit of context for us. The the scene begins when Jesus returns back to his hometown of Nazareth. Now, some people maybe in East London or online or here in the room would say, well, hang on a minute, wasn't wasn't Jesus a Bethlehem boy? You know, I remember the Christmas carols, I went to Bethlehem. Well, yeah, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but then there was a king called Herod the Great. He was paranoid and bloodthirsty, and he didn't want any rival to his throne. And so he issued a decree that all of the, the, the young male children under two years of age around Nazareth should be killed. Now, Naz- oh, sorry, around Bethlehem should be killed. Now, Bethlehem at the time was probably only a 
village of maybe 1,500 residents. So we're maybe talking like a dozen to 15 baby boys under the age of two in that village at the time. So if you're Joseph, good luck hiding your boy. It's not like there's hundreds of them. There's only maybe a dozen or 15 boys. And so Joseph did what I guess any father would want to do. He fled and he took Mary the children, Jesus, he took them to Egypt where they fled and lived there for probably about a decade until he heard that Herod had died and it was safe to return. As he returns, God warns him in a dream to go, uh, not back to Bethlehem, but to go to Nazareth. And so he ends up in this district called Galilee and a town called Nazareth. Then from what we know about Jesus, uh, from about 12, the Bible says at 12 years of age that he was obedient to his parents. That's how you know he was God. He was exceptional. And um, so from 12 to 30, we don't know much about Jesus except that he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, and that he likely learned his father's trade as a carpenter in this small town called Nazareth. Uh, like any Jewish man, Jesus would have gone to the synagogue, he would have been taught the scriptures, he would have learnt the scriptures, he would have been involved in his local community, and Nazareth was a very small village at the time, so Jesus would have been known to everyone who lived in Nazareth. Well, then at about 30 years of age, Jesus leaves Nazareth and he takes the journey to the Jordan River to be baptized by a guy called John the Baptist. And uh, it's at that point that Jesus really bursts onto the scene and his public ministry begins. Uh, at, at Jesus' baptism, there's a voice that comes from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove. It's like a picture of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit right there in one scene. Then Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted and tested for 40 days. He resists, he overcomes temptation. Then the Bible says that he returns turns in the power of the Holy Spirit and he begins teaching and preaching and performing miracles and the word starts to spread about this new prophet, rabbi, miracle worker guy called Jesus. And so with that having taken place, some scholars would say that's maybe about a, a, an eight to ten month window between Jesus leaving to get baptized and coming back to Nazareth in this scene that we see in Mark chapter 6. And so Jesus returns back to his hometown and instead of being welcomed with honor, the Bible says that they took offense at Jesus. Aren't people just so stupid? They took offense at Jesus instead of honoring him. And the Bible says in Mark chapter 6 and verse 5 that he could do no mighty work there because they failed to honor him. Now, I want to point something out this morning, church. It doesn't say that Jesus would do no mighty work there. So, so don't get this idea that Jesus was like, well, what, what, no ticket tape parade? No honor? Fine. You're not getting any miracles. Back on the tour bus, guys. Let's go. Like, it's not that picture. It's not like Jesus got offended because they weren't propping up his ego enough. It doesn't say he, he wanted to. Who knows? The will of God is always to heal and to help and to restore. He wanted to. It wasn't a, a lack of will. The Bible says that there was something in the environment of that town where he could do no mighty miracles. Now, this is amazing because when you look in Mark chapter 5, just like the previous chapter, Jesus was in a purple patch. Like in the previous chapter, Jesus has healed a woman who's had a 12-year blood condition. He's raised a girl from death to life. That's in Mark chapter 5. Then he gets to Nazareth, and there's a few miracles, a few healings, but nothing really to write home about. And so I read this, and I say, what's going on here, right? Is Jesus just in a period of hot and cold form? It's like the Brisbane Lions, like wins one week and out there. Sorry, I'm just taking shots at everyone this morning. Did he have a good day in Mark chapter 5, and they just bad luck, Nazareth, you caught him on a bad day in Mark chapter 6. What's going on here? Was Jesus just being moody? Was he being fussy? What's going on? Well, the Bible actually tells us in verse 6, it says that Jesus marveled. Everyone say marveled. Just nudge the person next to you and say, you're a marvel. Jesus marveled in East London, pay attention. Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. What what would make Jesus marvel? You know, there's only a couple of references, two references in all of the Gospels, the, the biographical, biographical accounts of Jesus' life. There's only two references to him marveling at something. 
It, it wasn't the infrastructure of the Roman government. It wasn't the opulence of, of, of Herod the Great. It wasn't even the wisdom of the scribes and the Pharisees. What was it that made Jesus marvel? Well, the first time we read of Jesus marveling at something was when Jesus saw the faith of the Roman centurion. The Roman centurion was obviously Roman. He was a Gentile. He was a non-Jew. He was a stranger and a foreigner to the God of Israel, but he had a servant who was at home paralyzed. And Jesus said to the Roman centurion, well, I'll come to your house and heal him. And and look at what the centurion said. It'll be on screen. The centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and, and said to those who followed him, whoa, check this out. Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. And so what was it that made Jesus marvel? One word, faith. It was faith that made Jesus marvel. What's the second time in the Gospels that Jesus marveled? It's right here in Mark chapter 6. Jesus marveled, not at their faith, but Jesus marveled at their lack of faith. How amazing is that? That it's the presence or the absence of faith that makes Jesus marvel. And when there's faith, I mean, when there's faith, Jesus heals a centurion's servant at a distance. Jesus does a miracle by proxy. Jesus just mails it in. There's so much faith in the centurion's heart because the centurion realized that this Jesus is God. This Jesus is a miracle worker. And when there's that much faith, there's nothing that Jesus can't do. But when there's unbelief, Jesus' hands are effectively tied up. The omnipotent it has his hands tied. There's not much that he can do and there's no mighty work. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't respond to us based on whether or not he's having a good day, but God responds to us according to our faith. And I tell you what, that's good news today because all of us have got different pasts, all of us have got different levels of intellect, all of us have got different hobbies and interests, but all of us though, we're different in all of those things. Who knows, every person can have faith. Young, old, religious, irreligious, we can all have faith faith. And I want us to have the kind of church, I want us to have the kind of environment here at Calvary where God's hands aren't tied. But when the Holy Spirit moves among us, He finds a posture and a heart of faith, people who believe Him, where there's no limit to what God can do. Who knows, that happens not just by default, but that happens where there is a heart and an attitude that believes God. Can you say amen today? And so I want to give us four red flags to a life of faith. Number one is this. When we allow past experience to frame our expectation, that's a red flag. Notice that they said, is this not the carpenter? Well, of course they thought that because they'd known Jesus in his earlier years when his divinity was well hidden. But, but now, after nine or ten months, Jesus had returned in the power of the Spirit under completely different circumstances. But the people of Nazareth made this mistake. They were so focused on past experiences that they missed out on what Jesus could do in that present moment. And who knows, there's a propensity in all of us to do the same. Because if you're anything like me, it's very easy to allow the disappointment of yesterday to frame my level of expectation for today. It's very easy to allow the unanswered prayers of last year to, to, to kind of determine my level of faith when I think about the future. It's very easy to allow, you know, that letdown from God or from a person or from the church to, to kind of determine where our faith and expectation sits for the future. And I want to tell you this morning, church, that's a red flag. If you allow your present faith to be determined by yesterday's picture, then it's always going to reduce down what God is able to do in your life. Peter learned this lesson, didn't he? In Luke chapter 5, the Bible says that Jesus came to preach and the crowds were pressing in about Jesus so so much that, that he needed a floating platform. And so he jumped on the boat and he preached from the boat so he wasn't crushed on the seashore. And the Bible says that after he preaches his sermon, he, he says to Peter, hey, thanks for loaning me your boat. Now, why don't you, you let down your nets for a catch? Who knows, if you give to God, you never end up shortchanged. You gave to me, I'll, I'll give, but I'll make sure you're not shortchanged for that time, Peter. And so he says, Peter, why don't you let down your nets for a catch? And Peter says, well, master, we've toiled all night and caught Nothing. That is one thing I have in common with Peter. My fishing experiences are the same. Anyone else like that today? 
We, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Who knows? That's an attitude of someone who's been disappointed. We tried and it didn't work. We once prayed for healing and there was no answer. We once believed God and it didn't work out. Oh, we once got involved in a church, but you know, things went bad. And it's, it's an attitude of a person who's tried but failed, who's had an appointment but then been disappointed. It's the attitude of someone who's been let down by life. But I love what Peter said. Peter said, Master, we told all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. Don't you love that church? That Peter, rather than letting his faith be determined by yesterday's disappointment, he rather set his level of faith at what Jesus had said to him in the moment. Never allow yesterday's disappointments, yesterday's failures, the things that didn't work out, never let that set the level of expertise. Isn't this just the carpenter? You can miss the Messiah because you're too busy looking at a carpenter. And maybe you're missing things in your future because you're still crying over what didn't work in the past. Listen, don't ever let your theology and your faith in God be lowered to the level of your biggest disappointment. Always lift your theology to what Jesus said, what God has promised, who you know him to be. That'll lift your level of expectation for the future. I loved being able to dedicate uh, Cam and Betty's little girl Gigi this morning because who knows, four years of believing God. Who knows, that's every month for four years disappointment let down, not this month, didn't happen. You know, in that season, some of us will remember we're in the room, Cam wrote a song called Faithful. And I think it was Calvary Conference two years ago. He said, listen, my wife and I were believing to fall pregnant and here's a song I wrote. And uh, how's it go? I could sing it, it would bless the people. (laughs) Through every season, in every storm, I know you are faithful, faithful through it all. Nailed it. Um, Who knows? What that was, that was Cam and Betty deciding, we're not going to let last month's disappointment lower down what we're believing God for. Uh, where have you lowered the bar in faith? Where have you shrunk things down? Where have you, have you taken your cues from yesterday rather than looking to the Word of God and, and taking your cues from the Word of God? I want to encourage you afresh, attach your hope and your faith to what God has said, not just to what didn't work yesterday or the day before. Uh, number two, is this the second red flag, is this when we reduce things down to human explanations. Notice this, they said, oh, that's the son of Mary and the brother of James. Who knows, the people of Nazareth, they knew Jesus' human roots, and so they assumed he was nothing special. Now, perhaps if Jesus had dropped from the sky without mother or father, just dropped from the sky, uh, like some type of alien force, maybe then they would have shown him a little bit more respect, but they knew his mum, and, and they knew his brothers, And so they thought, oh, there's nothing to see here. They said, oh, there's nothing special about that guy. That's the son of Mary and his brother, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, I play on a soccer team with Jimmy. Ah, there's nothing special about that guy. And who knows, the funny thing is they were right. He was the son of Mary. And he was the half-brother of James. And so who knows, the people of Nazareth, they were right. And yet they missed it by a mile. And it's possible to go through life judging everything on outward appearances, and you are right, and yet you miss the plan of God by a mile. Think about this. Jesus, the Bible says, was was fully man, and yet fully God. The Apostle Paul would explain it this way, that he was the fullness of God dwelling bodily. Or, or, Or John would say it this way, he was the eternal word, the logos of God, come in flesh. But the people of Nazareth formed all of their conclusions based on how things appeared, based on human explanations. And so compare that to the Roman centurion that we spoke about earlier. The Roman centurion ascribed to Jesus all the power of the creator. And so what did they receive? A creative miracle. But but the people of Nazareth ascribed to Jesus all the power of a carpenter. So what did they receive? I don't know table, a couple of chairs, I guess. Because normally, you will receive from God in proportion to how you perceive Him. If you, re- if you perceive Jesus as just a good moral teacher, you know what you'll receive from Jesus? Good moral teaching. If you perceive Jesus as a nice historical example, you will receive from Him a nice historical example. But, but if you perceive Jesus to be a healer, 
you're probably much more likely to receive healing. If you perceive Jesus to be the Son of God, you're much more likely. Can you see how God always works in accordance to our faith? That's why you've got to be very careful what you read online and what you allow to fashion your view of God. That's why you want to get your head into the Word of God so you can get a clear picture of what God is like. Because according to your faith, how you perceive Him will determine how you receive Him and what you receive from Him. Think about this. All they saw was the Son of Mary and they missed the Son of God. All they saw was a carpenter, and so they missed the Christ. And so because God has chosen to work in human form, it was a stumbling block to the people of Nazareth because they just couldn't get past his humanity. And you know, to this day, God typically works through human forms. God works through people. And you know what? It's still a stumbling block. I see people who come to church and they never get anything deposited into their spirit. They never get anything of substance of faith deposited into their heart because they get tripped up on a person's humanity. And because they get tripped up on a person's humanity, they're unable to get any impartation of the grace of God in their heart. People say, oh, he's so short. He speaks funny. I don't like that connect leader. Oh, I've known her since she was a kid. Have you seen how they dress? That mannerism that they have, it's really annoying. And so because they get so focused on the human, they never receive anything. Who knows, outward appearances can be a stumbling block to receive. Who knows, you can get so caught up on the human side of church that you miss the presence of God. 15 minutes ago, some of us really got a touch from God and others of us were thinking, that's Sam Pascoe, he needs a shave. (laughs) Isn't it true? How does that work? If you spend all of your time basing things on human explanations... This is not a new phenomenon. The people of Nazareth did this as well. Oh yeah, Mary's son, James's brother, and they missed. So Who knows? You can actually look in the mirror and get so discouraged by your own human frailties that you lose sight of the gifts and the grace of God within you. Didn't Paul say that we have this treasure in jars of clay? And you can either look at the jar of clay or you can look at the treasure that God has put within you. Listen, don't get too hung up on your faults and your foibles and your failings. You've got to remind yourself, yep, yep, I'm imperfect. I'm a jar of clay. And yet God has put his spirit within me. God has called me. He's saved me. He's got promises for my life. You choose what you focus on and what you focus on will really determine your level of faith. Is this helping anyone today? Number three is this, when we take offense. I I warmed you up. (laughs) When we take offense. The Bible just says it pretty plainly. And they took offense at him. Now, we might think of Jesus and think, who could ever be offended by Jesus? Like, that's like saying you hate puppy dogs. Like, like how could you be offended at Jesus? Like, what? Well, we don't really think of Jesus as offensive, but to the first listeners, Jesus was very offensive. Because at a minimum, he was claiming to be a great prophet equal to maybe Elijah or Elisha. And they saw that as an assumption of superiority and it was too much for them to handle. And so the Bible says that they took offense. And you can almost feel it in the passage, can't you? You can almost feel the point at which they take offense because they're saying, wow, great teaching. Man, like he's done some miracles, uh, but hang on. Now, who does this guy think he is? Now, you can almost feel it in the story. Ah, no, his son and brother of, who does this guy think he is? And they take offense at him. And who knows, from that moment on, Jesus could never do any mighty work. Because God works with faith, not cynicism. Because fundamentally, cynicism is sin. Let, Let me explain. Hebrews 3 verse 12 says this, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Who knows, the more cynical and the more critical we become, the less God tends to move in our life because cynicism is the counter opposite to faith. Who knows, faith believes, but cynicism refuses to believe. I I see through everything. Faith trusts, but cynicism, I'm not going to get duped. Uh, I, 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 cynicism refuses to trust. And so can you see how they are complete opposites? And that's why when a person goes from offense to cynicism, and it's a very short step between the two, it's amazing how there stops being a flow of God's grace. There stops being a flow of God in their life. Why? Because their heart became hardened and cynical. The Bible describes it as a hard heart and a stiff neck. Ever had a stiff neck? Some of you are like, yeah, today. When you've got a stiff neck, you just... You, just, you can't move. 
You become unresponsive. It becomes hard, hard to move. And we can do this spiritually where we get a hard heart and we get a stiff neck. We won't move. Oh, I won't believe. You can't move me, pastor. I'm, I'm unmovable. When you tell the church to lift their hands, I'm going to fold my hands. Oh, I won't be moved. It's a hard heart. And it's a stiff neck. Let me, let me just give a, a, a quick warning. There's a lot of talk in society at the moment, particular, particularly amongst 30-somethings who have grown up in church, about deconstructionism. Well, I'm deconstructing my faith. And, and let's just speak to that for a minute. There's a big difference between having a critical mind and a cynical heart. A critical mind is a mind that seeks to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A critical mind is faith-seeking understanding. But that's very different to a cynical, unbelieving heart. And so when someone says, well, I'm deconstructing my faith, he, he, he would be my encouragement. Watch the trajectory of their life. Because Hebrews says, if it leads somebody to have an unbelieving heart and to fall away from the living God, then they're not deconstructing in a positive way. What they're actually doing is they've got a sinful, evil, unbelieving heart. They're just dressing it up in academic, culturally cool language. Does that make sense? And, and the Bible calls it evil, not modern, not cool, not, oh, wow, <laughs> you're deconstructing. I feel so inferior to you. No, no, the Bible calls it evil. Let me tell you why it's evil. Because it's a declaration of mistrust against the character of God. Well, I just can't really trust him. And you call it deconstruction, but it's an evil, unbelieving heart. Who knows, you can still be thinking through your faith, but from a posture of belief and a posture of trust. And that's a totally different exercise. Here's the sad reality. Does that make sense? Here's the sad reality. The cynic believes nothing. And they end up receiving precisely what they believed for. Nothing. And and that becomes this spiral of unbelief because then God ceases to do anything in their heart and they say say to themselves, see, there's nothing to this God business. And what they don't realize is that they've actually positioned themselves in a spiral of unbelief and and in a place of cynicism and God can't work with that. Jesus' visit passed without many mighty works and that's why offense is so dangerous to our spiritual health because unbelief becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy and leaves our faith dry and barren. Do you think that might be why Jesus, when he taught us to pray, said, listen, every time you pray, pray this way, Father, forgive us our sins and help us to forgive those people who have sinned against us because Jesus knows that an offended heart becomes a cynical heart which becomes an unbelieving heart which just becomes a heart that God can't do anything with. Does that make sense today, church? And so I want to encourage us. Let's be people who keep a sweet spirit. Let's be people who know how to extend grace in the same way we've received grace. Let's guard a heart of faith. Let's treasure a believing heart because the rule of the kingdom is, according to your faith, let it be to you. And I want us to be the kind of people who always believe God to the hilt and then also see God working in our lives to the fullest extent. Can you say amen today? In East London, can you say amen? Powerful. Number four is this, last one, fourth red flag is this, when we allow familiarity to devolve into dishonor. Familiarity never evolves upward. It always devolves downward. When we allow familiarity to devolve into dishonor. Jesus kind of summarized this experience in Nazareth by saying, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. You know, in the previous town, they honored him and miracles broke out. But in Nazareth, Jesus was met with this kind of casual familiarity. The the same Jesus who raised the dead girl to life, the same Jesus who healed leprosy, the same Jesus who opened the eyes of the blind was of little help to the people in Nazareth, made little difference to their lives. Why? Because they gave him no honor. Here's what I want us to catch, church. And if you've been in church for like more than 12 months, I want you to really listen up here. There's a warning here for all of us if we're willing to see it. That it's the people who become familiar with Jesus who tend to receive the least help from him. It's the people who are the most familiar with Jesus that Jesus can do the least with if we don't guard our hearts. 
because sometimes the place where the prophet receives the least honor is in his own household and among his own family. Hint, what if that's speaking about the church, the household of faith, the family of God? Sometimes Jesus receives the least amount of honor in his own household. Now, now some people would say to me, well, 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 I've known, I've, I've known Jesus for, for 20 years, Pastor. And to that, I would say, that's wonderful. But, but if you're not careful, who knows, our longevity can work against us when it becomes familiarity. The risk is that the longer you know Jesus, the less difference he's going to make in your life. Because instead of keeping a posture of faith, you slunk back into a posture of familiarity. Does this make sense this morning? You know, I actually see this in, in how people come to church. Sometimes longevity, experience, becomes familiarity, which becomes dishonor. I see people who Monday to Saturday would never turn up late for a meeting with their boss or a potential client or the mayor. They're not late for work. They're not late for sport. They're not late for a movie. And yet they're regularly late for worship. And then they go home feeling like, oh, I don't feel like Jesus really did much today. No mighty works. I don't really feel like faith is making much of a difference in my life. To me, that sounds a lot like the parishioners at Calvary Nazareth. You picked a good day to turn up to church on time because I'm coming after you today. Like, just so you know, it's like, it's like a running joke among church staff that you know the new people in church because typically they arrive early. Because they've not yet become familiar. They've still got a sense of reverence for God and for the house of God. And sometimes Jesus gets the least honor from his own household. Do you catch what I'm saying today, church? You know, it's this, it's this lack of punctuality, the tardiness, this nonchalance. It's a kind of contempt that stems from familiarity. And, and I'm going for it today, church, because it's not healthy. It's a red flag to a life of faith. And some of us need to take note. Some of us need to decide, I refuse to be more devout and I refuse to be more honoring to my football team and to the cinema and to the workplace than I am to the house of God. Because if we don't address it, if we don't address it, familiarity becomes casualness. Casualness becomes dullness. Dullness becomes apathy and dishonor. Some people say, oh, well, pastor, I get to church every three or four weeks because, you know, we like to go to the beach and we like to go shopping. And to that person, I'd say, that's great. Just Jesus probably won't make much of a difference in your life. Strong words, I know, but it's the lesson from Nazareth. And, and I'm your pastor, not your mom. And, 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 and really what I want to say is if we let this casual familiarity reside in our spirit, it becomes a cancer to our spiritual health and we fall short of what God could do in and through our lives. Let me tell you why. It's because it's an attitude that ascribes no honor to the Lord Jesus. So if you've been following Jesus for any length of time, and I count myself in this, let's be people who say, I refuse to let my longevity work against me. I'm going to honor the Lord. It's not a diary issue. It's not a calendar issue. It's not a traffic issue. It's a heart issue. First Peter says this, but in your hearts, Honor Christ the Lord as holy. You know what holy means? Set apart, sacred. There ought to be some parts of your life that are sacred, that, that nothing else gets in the way of it. It's holy. Why? It's not because of calendar traffic, all of that stuff. I get it. Life is busy. But let's be people who in our hearts, we say, you know what? I'm going to honor the Lord Christ as holy in my heart because it's honor that opens us up to receive from the Lord. When we honor the Lord with our time, with our energy, with our wealth and possessions, it's honor that opens us up to receive from God. You might say, well, pastor, you just want me in church every Sunday. It's worse than that. What I want to do is I, I, I want to drive that casualness and that familiarity and, and that kind of slackness that can come into all of us. Let, let's drive that out of our hearts and let's replace it with, with a reverence and an awe and a sense of worship and a sense of wonder because who knows in that environment there's no end to what Jesus can do. And I'm just believing that this week across our church as, uh, as we come into Calvary Conference, I'm just believing that we'd be those kinds of people. Who knows where Jesus finds faith? 
Jesus will never force himself on you. He'll never kick the door. He's not Chuck Norris. He won't kick the door down to come into your life. But, but where he finds faith, where he finds an openness, where he finds honor, there he will move greatly. I want that for my heart. I want that for my home. I want that for your life. I want that for our church together. Let's be people who re- we refuse to get familiar, but rather we honor the Lord Jesus as Christ in our heart, in our environment, in our church together. Can you say amen today? Come on, why don't we stand to our feet? And uh, online, stay with us, South Africa. Just want to pray. Pray that, that Jesus, when he passes by our life, would find honor and faith. Come on, why don't we lift our hands to heaven? Then we're going to take a moment to worship him. Lord, I thank you for every person in East London right now, every person online, every person here on the Sunshine Coast. Lord, I pray that the posture of our hearts might be one of worship. Je- Jesus, we don't want to miss out on what you have for our lives. We don't want to miss out on what you have for our church. So Lord, I pray that our hearts would be quick to ascribe to you all of the honor, the worship, the praise, the glory, the wonder that you deserve. Fully God, yet fully man. God in flesh. Lord, we worship you and you. We honor you. Lord, there is no end to what you can do. And for him who believes, nothing will be impossible. Lord, lift our level of believing. I pray for every person today in church who disappointment has brought down their level of faith. Let it rise today in Jesus' name. We lift our faith to the level of the promise of God, the Word of God, the purpose of God. Let faith rise in our hearts for greater days and greater things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, why don't we take a moment to worship just now before we close our service to give you an opportunity. opportunity to make a personal decision of faith in Jesus. Perhaps as you watch this, you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian or a religious person. I want you to know today that it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been or what you've done. God loves you. And we believe at Calvary that every person can have a personal relationship with Jesus just by putting simple faith in Him. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of faith in Jesus. And perhaps you feel a million miles away from God today. Truth is, you're one prayer away. Maybe you've once had an active faith, but you would say that that faith has gone cold. And today, you want to make a recommitment of faith in Jesus. Well, I'm going to invite you also to pray this prayer with me. There's going to be details on the screen in a moment uh, as to how you can let our team know that you'd like to make this decision of faith. But together, why don't we pray and make this decision to put a personal faith in Jesus. Come on, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today and I put my faith in Jesus. Would you forgive me for my sin? Would you fill me with your spirit? Would you give me the power to live a new life following Jesus? From this moment forward, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer, then I believe that God has done a miracle in your heart today. And I also believe that that's not a decision or a prayer that you should outwork in isolation. I think if you let someone from our team know that you've prayed that prayer, you're going to do much better at continuing to grow in your faith and your relationship with God. So why don't you follow the details on the screen? Let us know. Hey, I prayed that prayer today. I'd love some um, resource, some encouragement, have some questions answered so I can keep growing in my faith. I know that our team would love to connect with you and help you in your journey forward. God bless you. Hey, this week, why not connect with us online uh, through the Calvary podcast? You can catch up on some old messages and content via our YouTube channel and stay in touch via social media. And until then, look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We'll be at home. The war will be over. Soon we will meet our Savior face to face.
Jesus Christ, the King above all.